Okay, uh, we'll just test the mic, check. Okay, it's on. We're good? Okay. Um, good morning, uh, Cross Worship Center, for those who are, um, which is the majority, uh, t tuning in online. We thank you so much for joining us, uh, for being faithful uh, to tuning in. Uh, we're very privileged to have you guys uh, here, and to, for, I'm very privileged myself to be asked to um, speak uh, on this um, passage in Luke chapter 2. Um, so I wanted to, do, let's just go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Um, for those of you guys who already heard, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> we'll, be at, we'll be going through that, uh, um, this chapter, but we, we will be flipping around a little more, but I'll, I'll give you guys all a heads up. Um, let's open up in a word uh, of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you. We just thank you so much um, for your heart, God. We thank you so much for humbling yourself, Lord, um, for stepping, stepping down from glory and taking on the essence of a, of a servant or of a slave um, to, to live among sinners, Lord, to die in the midst of sinners, God. We don't, we truly don't deserve what you've given us, God. We just thank you for this message of hope. We, we ask, Lord, that um, as I bring your word, God, Lord, that your word would prevail, that, you, um, that many people would hear this, uh, this truth, Lord, that they would hear the, the, the gospel message, Lord. We ask, Lord, that your word would pierce many hearts, that people would when they turn off this live stream or they, you know, they walk, walk away from it, that they will feel your presence, God, that they'll know that your word is true. They'll know that your word is, it's uh, relevant, Lord. Um, it speaks to us, Lord, even, even to those with calloused hearts, Lord, it, it can cut through all that, God. And that's what we ask for today. We ask for that your, for your Holy Spirit, God, to fall among, uh, fall on everyone, who is watching this, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you will speak through me. Please, Lord, I want to ask, Lord, that you will uh, remove anything, any uh, pride or any ego or any um, whatever it may be, Lord, of myself, Lord, that will get in the way of your word going forth, God. I just want to ask, Lord, that you will use me, your servant, as um, a platform or a mouthpiece, God, to speak, Lord. And I ask, Lord, that your word would be elevated over my own. We pray this in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so for, I'm assuming most of you have already turned to uh, Luke chapter 2. Uh, I thought before, well, actually, I'll go ahead and read the first maybe three verses, and then I'll kind of give a little more um, context in, um, as to what's going on during this time and this era. Uh, so let's go ahead and read. So, um, by the way, for those of you who are watching at home or might be using a Bible app, I do. I use the um, the King James Version. If if you want to follow along, you don't have to use it. It's just my preference. But anyway, let's go ahead and read. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Uh, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed every one into his own city. So to give a little bit of context of what, ha what happened prior to this, um, this decree is in about 31 years before Christ was born, so about 31 BC or 33 BC, there, uh, Rome was essentially a, it was a republic. Uh, and it was, uh, ruled by um, a Senate, and they had many different leaders that kind of made the decisions um, for Rome. And they even had many different, like, because we know that from, like, later accounts that Rome had emperors, okay, that were supreme leaders, supreme rulers, kind of like kings. Uh, but before, in about 31 BC, they didn't have that. It was ruled by Senate. It was ruled by 
uh, almost in a democratic way. So, and b before this, in about 31 BC, there was a war between Cleopatra, uh, the man we're seeing here, which is um, uh, Caesar Augustus, and also another gen uh, gentleman I cannot, from, not gentleman, but another person in history I can't remember the name of. But basically there was a war that went on, and this man, Caesar Augustus, he did not have that name Augustus, by the way. It was it something else. But he won that war. Uh, most of you who know history, Cleopatra, most historians say she killed herself. That's a long story. I don't need to get into that. But basically, he won the war. Prior to that, the Mediterranean in this area was a war-stricken, uh, poverty-stricken area. And for those of you who come from any kind of country where there was war, like literally going through your city or your town, you know that it becomes desolated. It becomes a, um, um, just catastrophic uh, what the results um, that happen after like a war. You know, th there's so many things that follow it. It's just poverty, uh, a lack of morale, um, a need for s someone to come fix things. And that's actually essentially what this uh, person in history, Caesar Augustus did, is he actually, when he gained control of Rome, he actually basically took over Rome, and it was no longer ruled by the Senate, it was ruled by himself. And that word Augustus, what it literally means in that original language is, is it means exalted or sacred. It's actually, a, it's not his name, it's not like, you know, we have a first and a last name that you're born with. This was not that. It was literally a title he gave to himself. Augustus means to be exalted or to be sacred or to be basically God. And that's exactly what he gave to himself. This was actually something that's interesting is that Caesar Augustus was the first emperor of Rome. And before that, they didn't have that. He actually brought stability to the Mediterranean during that time. <laughs> he brought uh, stability. He actually brought... Um, because he won the war against Egypt in 31 BC, he was able to basically plunder most of Egypt's wealth. And he used that money, that gold, all those treasures, to pay his soldiers and to um, fund basically his empire, the Roman Empire. And it actually brought some stability for um, a couple, you know, a couple, maybe a couple decades, it, or about 30 years or so. It brought some stability, some um, prosperity, and it, the only problem is, though, is that even though he was a benevolent dictator, something that's um, uh, unfortunate is that whenever we see emperors or dictators, um, usually there's inevitably what comes follows later is a revolt or a need for a revolt or a need for a political savior. And that's exactly what Israel had felt at this time because even though this man had brought peace, or at least a kind of a worldly sense of peace, there was, a, there was still a need for a greater, deeper sense of eternal peace that was not there. He was basically a pseudo-political savior in a way, but it, what happened was it actually became it became more and more relevant to the Jewish people during this time for, a, for their Messiah, but essentially what they longed for during this time was actually a political savior. This is part of the reason why so many um, uh, Jewish people during you know, the life of Jesus, why they came to him and they asked, if, why are you going to set up your kingdom? And they wanted him to overthrow the Romans. And, um, so we see this need, or at least this want, or this longing for that kind of political savior, and that's kind of what a lot of people thought of, um, at least a lot of the Roman people thought of Caesar Augustus. They thought of him more of a, as a political savior. So at least we're setting the stage now. We have a, a little bit of an idea of what's going on during this time. So we'll go ahead and uh, read it maybe one more time. It says right here, verse 3, and all went to be taxed, every one uh, into his own city. And uh, Joseph also went up from Galilee uh, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, uh, because he was of the, of the house 
and lineage of David, uh, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So this is something that I think is a little um, interesting. It's just something to think about. I, to be honest with you, I'm not totally sure what or why. Well, actually, there is some reason why. I'll explain it. But the, 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 the what is it called? The, um, the distance from Nazareth to Bethlehem, I heard it's about 80 miles walk. About, if you're going to walk or ride a donkey, it takes about, it's about 80 miles, a couple, you know, might take a week or two or something, depending on how fast you are. But something that's very interesting is that according to the law during the, the time of um, when this was written, the law in Rome was actually, if your wife was with child or pregnant, uh, and you know you had to go get taxed and go travel back to your own country, your own city, or whatever. Uh, she was not required to come with you. So then this kind of begs the question: Why did Mary go? And I think it's a very obvious reason, because of her controversial um, her controversial pregnancy. You can imagine during that time that if you were in Mary's shoes. And all of a sudden, an angel comes to you, tells you about, you know, this Messiah that will come through you, uh, that you'll, uh, you know, essentially uh, uh, bear the Messiah in you. And then you will give birth to him, and that the, this, is, this is conceived of the Holy Ghost. Uh, can you imagine telling, going and telling her, her family members, her relatives, and her, her friends, like, oh, you know, about this? I bet you many of them were skeptics. I bet you many of them... This would actually be considered punishable by death. Uh, so I guess in a way it is no wonder why she decided to go with Joseph is probably to spare the controversy or to avoid the, the um, humiliation. Uh, and so that, that's just inter something that I think is very interesting. But it says here, uh, let me see. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, uh, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Uh, and so it was that while they were uh, there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son uh, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Already we're kind of getting from verse 7, we're getting, uh, there's a lot there we have to unpack. Um, but there's something that's very interesting is that how the swaddling clothes would work is that they would essentially, when they had this newborn, they would uh, wrap him up very similarly to like a burrito. Like they would have, so where his arms would be kind of tight like this, you know, against his body. Uh, and it was meant, they were, they, whenever they would wrap him up in swaddling clothes like that, it was meant to uh, c basically get the child used to s submission, uh, submitting to the parents, submitting so that they're not just flailing their arms and crying. It kind of was able to give them, uh, it was forcing them to get used to that sense of submitting to their, their parents and submitting to authority which is very interesting because that's exactly what we know that Jesus did is he came and he, he uh, submitted, he came to submit himself um, as a servant. Uh, there's more here also to unpack. It says in verse seven, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in uh, swallowing clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Something that's very interesting, by the way, here is that it was not uncommon to wrap you know, infants or newborns in swaddling clothes. That was not an uncommon thing. But what was unique to this, what, was, what set this apart was the fact that he was in a manger, uh, in a feeding trough, essentially, uh, or in a barn, I guess you could say. That was completely unheard of, completely unheard of during this, uh, during this time period. That's what, one thing that set it apart. And it says right here, uh, she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. 
something that this reminds me of is uh, you, for those of you who are watching online, please turn to uh, uh, keep your hand though uh, where we're at in Luke chapter two. So don't lose your don't lose your spot, but go ahead and turn a few pages to the right over to Luke chapter nine. Luke chapter nine, verse uh, fifty-seven and fifty-eight. We we see in this account later on as Jesus is an adult and he has already started his ministry, that there comes a man to him um, who wants to essentially follow Christ. And he, asks, he, he says this. This is, by the way, not on the screen. I didn't have time to get it up there for you guys, so I apologize. But um, I'm assuming that most of you have already turned there. So it's Luke chapter 9, verse 47 and 48. So it says right here, all right, Luke chapter 9, verse 40, uh, 57, I meant to say. I'm sorry, 57. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee uh, whither so, uh, whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. And by the way, this was interesting because Jesus was obviously referring to the life that he was currently living during his, uh, his ministry. You know, but something that's very fascinating is that this is also a reference back to Luke chapter two, of when, when he was born. The son of man was not born in a castle. He was not born in royal, in a royalty. The king of kings was not born, uh, uh, in a, he was not born, like I said, in a in a castle or some government or some um, fancy hospital, so to speak. He didn't even have a place for himself. He had nowhere. All he had was a manger. All he had was filth. And I just think that's interesting. This kind of begs the question for, for all of us. When we, when, we fall, when we make that choice to follow Christ, are we, are we willing to follow him even through everything he's gone through? Are we willing to trace his steps are we willing to go through the mud? Are we willing to go through the, uh, the muck and the mire to follow him? And that's something that we need to align our hearts with whenever we are reminded of this. We need to remember the path that he took. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, we're going to continue reading in uh, verse 8 through 20. And there, they were in the same country, shepherds, abiding in, their, uh, in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about, uh, round about them, and they were sore afraid. Uh, something I wanted to point out here is that uh, shepherds were considered uh, ceremonially unclean uh, during this time. They were not allowed in, in the temple. They were not allowed uh, to partake in anything related to temple duties or um, uh, of the such. They were also considered to be outcasts, social outcasts. Um, it was the kind, they, were, they were the kind of people who were dealing with animals. They were dealing with manure. They were dealing with all sorts of disgusting stuff. And many people, many uh, Jewish people, uh, they didn't want to touch them. It's like, it's like a farmer today. I mean, we don't think of them that way, but at, at, back then they did, but it was more so for spiritual reasons because they knew if they touched them, they would have to basically, quote unquote, quarantine for <laughs> a certain amount of period of time before they could go back into the synagogue or the temple. Um, something else that's very interesting is that after studying this more, I found that their testimony was considered to be unreliable in the court of law. If something happened and they, like, you know, if they witnessed a murder or they witnessed someone stealing something or whatever it may be, and you bring, the, we know from scripture that it says, uh, according to the court in the Levitical law, you must bring two or three witnesses with you uh, if you want to have, uh, basically, you can't put a man to death without two or three witnesses. If you brought a shepherd as one of those witnesses, they were immediately disqualified because they were social outcasts, because they were ceremonially unclean, because, 
and it's, it's just crazy, but their, their eyewitness testimony was considered unre unreliable. And it's just, um, they were just nobodies. They were absolutely nobodies. And something that's very powerful and that I've, that I've found out is that most his historians and even some scholars, they, um, there's no real, I don't think there's any scriptural evidence for this, so uh, don't hold me to this. I'm just sharing with you what I've found. Um, that most, like, there's a lot of historians and scholars that actually say that they're, they believe that these same shepherds in this same region might have actually been responsible for uh, essentially watching or herding um, the lambs that they used for uh, temple sacrifices. Uh, they were in charge of at least what we know from history, not scripture, but history, that there's belief to say that they, um, or some evidence to say that they might have been in charge of the, the temple sacrificing, or you know, the, in charge of the lambs and stuff like that, the livestock. So let's keep, let's keep reading, okay? So uh, verse 9 says, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Uh, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is called, uh, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And like I mentioned before, this uh, finding a child in swaddling clothes was not uncommon. That was very it was a very common thing. But what was unique to this was the sign that, they, that this child would be lying in a manger. That was a very unique sign given by the angel. So that's something that they would look for. Um, verse 13 says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they, um, and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And uh, basically, and they, they just spread the word. So it says right here, and uh, verse 18, And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it were told unto them. So something I wanted to touch on right here is that if this... What I'm saying about, you know, a lot of historians believe that these shepherds were supposedly in charge of the flocks that they used for temple sacrifices, in charge of the lambs that they used for sacrificing for sin offerings. Something that is so powerful here is that God could have ordained or could have chosen for to reveal the good news of the, the messianic prophecy of this uh, the Messiah coming. He could have given this message to anyone. He could have given it to kings. He could have given it to governors. He could have given it to empires or nations or powerful people. He could have given it to the Pharisees. He could have given it to the scribes. But he, gave, he chose those whose hearts were open to this message, who would have received it with a humble and contrite heart. And not only that, I think it's very ironic, though, that, that essentially God would allow for, these, for the angels to take the mes this message of hope uh, to essentially the, the, the temple shepherds who were in charge of... The, the lambs that they would use for sacrificing, that he would, they would be the first people to hear the message of the Lamb of God who has come, 
who has uh, come to them. And I think it's very powerful to see, by the way, what it says about them that they, I said when they, as soon as they heard this, this message, they told each other, let's not waste any time, I'm paraphrasing, let's not waste any time and let's go tell everyone we can find about this, this good news about this message. And by the way, that's very good advice for any of you. For any of you that are hearing this message, I think our response should be the same. Our response should be, we have, heard, we have this message of hope. Don't, don't hog it to yourselves. Notice how it doesn't say that the shepherds, when they, they heard this message from God and they, they heard the angels bring this, this message of hope, it doesn't say that they just said, oh, wow, that was pretty cool. Let's go ahead and continue our work. They could have, I mean, they could have done it, but they didn't do it. That's not what their, their response was. Their response was, let's go ahead. Let's, let's tell everyone we can find about this message of hope. And our message today should be no different. It should be exactly the, the same response as them. Uh, let's go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter, I believe it's Matthew chapter 2. Yeah, Matthew chapter 2. So go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter 2, for those of you who are uh, with us online. Now this is, um, a lot of people tend to look at this passage in Matthew chapter 2 as a parallel passage to Luke chapter 2, but it's actually not. Uh, at least, well, I won't say it's not, it's just that it's done in a different time period, slightly different time period. So it's not really, um, this. it's not being done at the same time. I mean. This is the, by the way, Matthew chapter 2 is uh, the message about the, the wise men who came to king. Uh, they were led to Jerusalem uh, by the, the star in the east, um, and they came to, you know, King Herod. We all know the story. They said, we wanna, we've heard of this, uh, this uh, king of the Jews that's born or whatever. So anyway, the, Herod tells them, you know, go search diligently for them so that I may go worship too. We all know he was lying from the scripture, like he wanted to go, you know, eliminate the, the threat, essentially. But um, something I wanted to uh, touch on a little bit here uh, is, let's go ahead and start in Matthew chapter 2, verse 9. Is It says right here, verse 9, when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. Verse 10 says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Verse 11 says, uh, this is kind of where I want to really unpack things. Verse 11 says, and when they uh, were come uh, into the house, they saw the young child and Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had uh, opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, which were gold and frankincense and myrrh. Something that um, a lot of people tend to uh, believe about, I, I've heard some people say that these gifts that were brought, like gold and frankincense and myrrh, a lot of, I've even heard people say that this, was, this is not symbolic, that it has nothing to do with, like, and it's basically just a, a very kind diplomatic uh, gesture that these wise men gave to Christ, uh, Jesus as a young boy. Um, oh, and by the way, something I wanted to make clear here is that in Matthew chapter 2, it doesn't say that Jesus is a baby here. It says that he is a young boy. So I think that's for something to keep in mind that it does say that they traveled, uh, you know, they, they saw the star in the sky, they heard about the, probably knew some Old Testament scriptures and came to worship. But it, this, uh, we know that from this passage, it says later on that King Herod put out a decree to, to uh, slay all children that were two years old and under. So that kind of gives us a limiting factor to know that Jesus at this point was a young boy, not necessarily a baby, but a young boy, had to have been under the age of two at that point. So just to put that into perspective, this is not necessarily happening in the same time period as when Christ was born in Luke chapter 2. It's just saying that probably sometime after. But anyway, something I thought was interesting is I wanted to really uh, unpack some of the, the symbolisms 
that have to do with these gifts that were given by the wise men and why it's important for us to understand it. Uh, for those of you who may already know, gold is a sign of royalty. It's a sign of, or it's uh, si significant with wealth and power. And it's gold is a gift fitting for a king. We know that for many kings in the Old Testament and many kings in history in general are given gold for many different reasons, as gifts, as for ransom money, for different uh, uh, things. And, you know, sometimes their, their, even their outfits, even their, their crowns would be made of this. It was something uh, signifying a sense of royalty, a sense of kingship. Uh, so, and also a sense of kingdom, as we know, like, you know, uh, someone who is in charge of a kingdom, just like we see in Daniel chapter 2 with the, the, the statue of Nebuchadnezzar and the head of gold. It's, a, it's actually symbolic for someone who, can, who rules an empire, rules a kingdom. And that's, that's what that is signifying, the gold. So now this is interesting, too. Uh, frankincense, the, the second gift given in uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, why it's important is frankincense is used in the temple as to be burned as incense, as a holy anointing oil. And perfume, it's being used for, it's used as perfume as well. According to Exodus chapter 30, verse 30 uh, through 34, uh, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter chapter 30, verses 30 through 34, we know that frankincense is also essential for the priest's office as a meaning of ministering, get this, ministering to God. Wow, isn't that crazy? It's a, it's, a, it's a way that the priests, they would literally minister to the Lord by, with, with frankincense. All right, so now let's move on. So it, um, in the, uh, and it, it, is so pre uh, it is so precious and so sacred, frankincense, that if a stranger or anyone that is not associated with the priest's office so much as touches it, they must be cut off or killed or outcast from their people. You had to, this was a very special thing. You had to have been essentially a part of the priest's office or a high priest himself. Because of the heavy use of frankincense in the temple, it is very symbolic for Christ's deity and also the fact that he is our high priest. Not, something that's also interesting to point out is that frankincense uh, in ancient, ancient times is said that um, frankincense and myrrh actually are more, were, were considered to be more valuable than gold in those days. They were incredibly expensive too. Um, during the time of the Roman Empire, just a very small bottle, about that big, of frankincense could cost as much as about $100 today. Just a couple itty-bitty little bottle, about that big. Very, very precious. Um, now, this is kind of where things get very interesting. Now we're going to focus on the third gift that was given by the wise men, and that's myrrh. We already talked about gold, now we're talk we already talked about frankincense and the symbolisms of both, and now we're going to talk about the last, which is myrrh. Why is myrrh important? Does it have any symbolic uh, significance? And here's unpacking that, we will see. Myrrh uh, was known for its bitterness, but has many different uses in the Bible. In Esther chapter 2, verse 12, it's used as purification, in Exodus chapter 30, verse 23, uh, myrrh is used as anointing oil. In Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 6, um, it is used as perfume. In John chapter 19, uh, verse 39, uh, the woman who, ascent, who washed Christ's feet in the, in the presence of the Pharisees, she, what did she use? As, as a burial, an embalming, she used myrrh. She, she and her tears, essentially, and her hair to wash the Lord's feet. 
It was used, myrrh is used as embalming and burial. Uh, it's also used uh, in Mark chapter 15, verse 23, as medicine and painkiller. And, and the last one right here is in Proverbs chapter 7, verse 17 through 18. It's used uh, in, uh, essentially for weddings, and uh, as a, as a, it's symbolic as an act of love. Wow. I mean, there's a lot there in, in, in this last one that I think is really important. Uh, for, uh, and by the way, this is something I think is very interesting, is that for myrrh to be cultivated, it must be extracted by piercing the tree's heartwood and allowing the gum resin uh, to trickle out into bitter red droplets called tears, or essentially the blood of the tree. Uh, incredibly symbolic for what Christ would eventually do on the cross. Um, So something that I think is very interesting is that this was uh, not just a, these gifts that were given were not just a kind diplomatic gesture towards someone who they thought might be a king. It was a true act of, of adornment and, dedic and worship towards who they believed to not only be a political messiah, but to be the true Messiah, a spiritual Messiah, someone who would deliver them from their sins. They knew that he was so much more than what many eventually would think of him to be as a political Messiah to overturn the Romans. They, they, they realized the significance of Jesus coming. They gave him gifts of gold as a, as a sign of reverence towards their, their king, the king of kings, a sign of kingship and royalty and wealth and power. Uh, they gave frankincense as a way of showing Christ that he was, um, he was so much more. He, it was a way of acknowledging his, his deity, Christ's deity, that he is, um, even though he is in full submission to God the Father, he is equal with him. Just like the Trinity, we know that uh, the triune nature of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, that they recognize that this is Christ the King, the one who sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. That we are, it's, th these gifts were, um, it was a sacrifice of their possessions, of their, their finances, but more so it was uh, a gift of their heart. It was a way of saying, Lord, we recognize your deity. We recognize that you are our high priest. And myrrh being the last one is, a, is symbolic for uh, bitterness. It was known for its bitterness. And which is, by the way, uh, goes perfectly hand in hand with when Jesus was hanging on the cross. Uh, he said, I thirst, and he tasted from the sponge that had that vinegar in it. He was tasting bitterness of death. And it, it's just so powerful when you, when you really dig into these things, it makes you understand like where these wise men, where their hearts were coming from, where, they, where their hearts were, how their hearts were aligned with the, the reality of why Christ came. And I think one thing that is really important to take home is is there's essentially two things that I think we need to uh, remember is that right now, as we're listening, for those of you who are online listening to this message, from Luke chapter 2 and Matthew chapter uh, 2, we see all of this that had taken place, but we see essentially two responses. We see adorn, uh, acts of worship, dedication, love, reverence towards the King of Kings. And we see... How is, what is our reaction to this? When you read this, do you feel that same reverence that the wise men felt? When you read this, do you just walk away and you don't feel anything? Your heart, your heart cry should be crying out, 
I've come to worship you, Lord. Let me just sit at your feet. What do I have to give that you don't already have? Lord, just hear our prayers. This is the deepest act of worship you can ever see, I think, in Scripture. It's such an incredible thing. And I think our hearts need to be the same way. I, I wanted to, to end with this last thing. Many, It's so hard nowadays. We live in a, in a day and age where this incredible ho- uh, message of hope that we hear that's in the gospel and this amazing act of worship, unfortunately, is blended with a lot of selfishness. This Christmas message is, an, is supposed to be a time for us to receive the message of hope that is given to us, that our Messiah has come, and we are meant to give that. But it, oftentimes, all we can think about during Christmas time is, what can I get? What kind of gifts can I get? Very material things that will just fade away. And I think a lot of times it's very hard to separate the two, kind of the selfish side of Christmas and the, the you know, biblical message and theology that we hear in Christmas. And this right here, if, I'm going to have you guys turn to one last passage, and then I think we'll close. Please turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This right here, as you guys are turning, I think this is probably the, the message that is the theology of Christmas. In a, if you could put the theology and the good news of Christmas in a nutshell, this kind of sums it all up. And I'm going to try to just get through it real quick. Maybe we could have uh, the worship team, if you guys are going to come up, uh, you just get yourselves all ready and whatnot. Okay, so for those of you there that are there already, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he didn't see it as, he didn't, he, even though he was equal with God, he didn't see it as, Something to cling on to, which means he, in other words, he, when he knew the need that there, there must be, um, there, there has to be a way. He didn't, and he didn't hold on to his deity. But it says right here, um, verse 6, who, uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, verse 5, I believe it is. Uh, uh, verse, yeah, so it's verse 6. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but verse 7 says, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant um, and was made in the likeness of men. This is part of the, one of the greatest mysteries for, uh, for us as believers and um, is something that's just mind-boggling and that really doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's just the truth, is that Jesus was not 50% man and 50% God. He was 100% man and 100% God at the same time. We know from Scripture that he wept, he, know, he drank, he slept. He know what it's like to be tired. He, uh, it, the list kind of goes on and on. He, he, he had human fleshly desires, but he also at the same time being God uh, in the flesh. is just a mind-boggling mystery. Um, okay, verse 7, I'll read it one more time. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto, the, uh, unto death, even the death of the cross. Verse 9, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to, uh, to the glory of God the Father. And let that essentially be our, our this is the, the reality of why Jesus came. It's, it sums it all up that even though he had his deity, he, he had, um, he, he essentially gave up his, uh, even though he was still God in the flesh, he humbled himself of no reputation and he essentially surrendered in a way his deity and his, and his while still, still obtaining it, still having it, he, he didn't look at it as, as something to cling on to. He, that's how much he loves you. That's how much he loves me, is that he was willing to give up those things. He was willing to give up that sovereignty of God so that those who, who humble themselves now can someday be exalted with Christ. So, I mean, I'm not sure if you guys are ready for the worship team to come up, but um, we can go ahead and close in a word of prayer. So let that be uh, what we take away, is that we, our response should be a truly humble, and a, have a, our heart should be in a place of reverence, of worship, um, towards our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. But we should not, we should not put that message of hope under, uh, we shouldn't hide it. We shouldn't keep it to ourselves. There are people out here who need to hear a message of hope, especially during this year where things have been so crazy. So let that be our heart right now. Is a, is a, our response to this message should be true uh, and contrite and worship that is in spirit and in truth. We need to be worshiping God in spirit and in truth. So as we also move on to a place of uh, worship, let's be, let's pray for boldness as a church. Let's pray for boldness as believers so that we can give this message of hope to those who need to hear it. Um, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for giving your son. We thank you for taking a place of a servant. You didn't have to do any of it, Lord. We thank you that your, your message of hope is is a message that's for, uh, not for a subset of uh, elite or groups of people, um, but it's for toward all men. This message of hope is for all men. It's for for even the lowliest of men, who are considered outcasts, who are considered sinners, who are considered unclean. This message of hope is for us, God. And it's for the rest of the world, Lord. Give us the boldness to share that message with those who are longing to hear this. We just thank you, Lord, for, your, uh, for who you are. We thank you for, for being born into this world and having absolutely no reputation that no, people wouldn't look on you as someone you know, someone that's worth looking at, really. You made yourself of no reputation, Lord, so that you could um, die the death of a, of a sinner, that you could take our place on the cross, Lord, so that we may live. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for this message of hope. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.